Greetings ladies and gents, and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Retreat Hell Chapter 8. Rudin watched out the window as the van bounced along the rough made roads through the portal. Looking at the human defensive line, berms, barricades, coils of wire, expanding earthworks, entrenched weapons and placements, all set up in an open killing field, backed by towers of elevated firing positions. Charging those fortifications would be suicide. His thoughts were interrupted by a loud, rapid thwacking sound coming from the front of the van. Leaning around Kowalski's chair, Rin saw that the abrasive marine was wiping his hands back and forth so fast that his finger was smacking and round tin. Fascinating. He watched Kowalski open the tin to reveal Brown shredded something while navigating the roads. Swerving around the barricade, Kowalski pulled a large pinch of the stuff out of the tin and stuffed it in his lower lip. Rinzia flicked. How is that not falling back out? Hey Kowalski, where did you get that? Kimba asked. Traded for it at the motor pool. Wasn't going to, since we were going to town, but I only had one can and me and we moved out, and I haven't had a dip since we got taken to Tolkien the first frickin' time. Get to share the wealth, man. Help yourselves he said, passing the can back, and Bradford snagged it and passed it over. You're a lifesaver, man, Kimber said, taking the tin and giving it a several thwacks from his own before opening it. You want some shields? He held it out in offering. Rin flicked his ears curiously. Probably not a good idea, Bradford pushed the tin back. Not until we have a better idea of what effects our drugs have on him, at least. Ah, probably right. Kimber shrugged, putting a much smaller pinch of the stuff into his lip. The can was quickly passed again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Kowalski called out in a smooth, clear tone. I'll be your tour guide for this previous first-class tour of planet Earth. He paused, opening up a bottle with one hand and spitting into it. Directly above us you'll see the great and mysterious portal linking Earth and Galha. Just ahead of us is a fortified defensive line protecting Earth from the Keebler scum. He spat into the bottle again. Keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times, and please remain seated until the ride comes to a full and complete stop. He raised his spitting bottle to a salute to more humans wearing different uniforms as they passed through the gate opening and the earthworks. Jostling past the rows, the tents, and the vehicles behind the wall, Kowalski spun the wheel with one hand, whipping them around the dirt road. Rin pressed his face into the window to keep himself from smacking into it as the van rattled over the hastily built roads, looking up at the alien sky above them. They passed a pile of torn up and uprooted trees, and with a final shudder, the metallic thunk that made half the van flinch and jerk Rin's face off the window. They bounced onto a hard road made of smooth, uninterrupted stone. Rolling on a much stronger road, Kowalski accelerated. They drove past the great white structures that Rin had seen from the air. Those are buildings, he thought as he tried to peer through the translucent walls, unable to discern what was within. Are those plants inside of them? Kowalski waved at several more uniformed humans as set up another checkpoint at the end of the road making a right turn onto the proper highway. For any foreign visitors in the party, should you get separated from the group, remember, the way home is off exit 43 and I-15, old highway 395. They cleared the small ridge of the left and Rin's eyes went wide as they accelerated towards a great stonework bridge that spanned the largest highway he had ever seen. It didn't look this big from the air. His reverie was interrupted when the van slowed abruptly, then jerked to the right, throwing Bradford into him and pinning him against her in the window. Jesus frickin' Christ, Kowalski, where the frick did you learn to drive? Bradford snapped, dragging herself back across the seat. Helmand Province, Kowalski replied with a smile. Goma, get us some tunes going. You bet. Gomez started tapping knobs and bumps on the panel between him and Kowalski as whatever artifice drove the vehicle roared as they began accelerating at an alarming rate. Rin jumped and screeched well for the air. He gritted his teeth, his ears against his skull. He clamped his hands on the sides of his head. Not that wussy stuff, but it on 100.7... The screech disappeared and was replaced with a chaotic mix of half words and cut-off sounds. And the bird watchers are reporting... Just 99.9. Nine. Oh, na 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 na. Oh. 
Esters are being kept back from the perim. The chaos ended as they swerved onto the great highway at breakneck speeds. Another vehicle flashed past them to the sound of a man speaking so fast. It sounded like a pure gibberish. The man's artifice howled as they choked over around another vehicle and accelerated even more in pursuit. I'm gonna die here, he realized as the world streaked by. True variety 100.7, said a deep male voice. Then the music began, a fast, hard-edged string instrument unlike any he'd heard before. Accompanied by a faint, tinking beat, Ren lifted his hands to his head and his ears perked up. He could recognize the skill of a musician, if nothing else. Oh, frank yeah, Kowalski said as a giant what of his upper lip danger popping out. Good job, Goma. Whew. Somebody shouted in the back. Ah, ha, 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 began a faintly in the air, increasing volume. Ah, na, 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 joined in half the van in the third round. Na, 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 na. The rest of the humans had joined in. Na, 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 na. Thunder. Gomez spun the knob and the volume increased. Thunder. The van shimmered and bounced. Carriages flashed to the right. An enormous long vehicle rumbled past to the left. Thunder. A two-wheeled vehicle rolled up on the left of the deep, thundering rumble that he could hear over the music. I was caught in the middle of a railroad track. Thunder, the voice sang, with the whole van joining in. A human sat astride his contraption, holding the handlebars and stretching above his head. He wore a leather pants, a vest, and a leather wrap on his head. His tinted glasses over his eyes. His bare arms were dyed with a riot of anger and intimidation. Feathered wings were embroiled on his back and his vest. I looked around and knew that there was no turning back. Thunder! Kowalski honked his horn three times in rapid succession and waved his hand at him, his outer fingers keeping up and his inner fingers down by his thumbs. My mind raced and I thought, what could I do? Thunder! The man looked over at Kowalski with a great beard and fur on his chin, flapping over his shoulder in the wind. He gave Kowalski a nod and twisted the handlebars. The rumble of the vehicle surged twice and he roared away. And I knew... There was no help. There was no help from you. Thunder. As the man roared away ahead of them, another two-wheeled vehicle rolled by. Then another. And another. There was a whole goddamn swarm of them. Sounds of drums beating in my heart. He felt the tap of his arm and he looked over to see Bradford grinning, holding onto a handle on the ceiling and the van bounced and swayed down the highway. Thunder of guns tore me apart. She leaned over, shouting over the music, and the other marines in the van slowed hard, jerked to the side, and roared ahead, Welcome to Earth. You've been thunderstruck. So, why aren't they just putting him in a chopper and flying him straight to the hospital? Edison asked. Thankfully, the volume had been turned down when, after several songs, the music had been replaced by commercials. I'm not sure which is louder, the music or the weapons. Because it's not an emergency flight, and this is an appointment for medical, not some high-level directive from the General Langstrom, Bradford shrugged. Honestly, this whole thing is still such a cluster freck. I think we just got slipped through the cracks. But you'd think the brass would be all over keeping tabs on him. I mean, uh, he stopped when Stevens laid a hand on his shoulder. Dude, like, take your blessings when you get them. When the seas throw you like kill a wave, just go with it, brah. Samson snorted. You know, Stevens, you're one of the dumbest ones of us, but you're also one of the wisers. Dig it, brah. Ren looked out the window. They had turned off the great highway and onto the smaller roads that still put a royal highway to shame. They passed now row upon row of houses, interspersed with small groves of trees or fields and many enormous buildings. Penny for your thoughts, Bradford said. He tore his eyes away from the window, meeting her eyes with a questioning flick of his ears. How many people live here? Here, yeah, Bradford waved out the window. This is a tri-city area between Vista, Carlsbrad, and Oceanside. She glanced up, thinking, maybe three, four hundred thousand? His ears slowly lifted and turned to her in shock. That's, um, almost as many people live in Gimei, in the new and old cities. And Greater San Diego County has three and a half million people, Samson chimed in. 
Rin flicked his ears back. How? How many humans are there? Like in the US or the whole world? Edison asked. What's the difference? Rin frowned. The Marines laughed. My friend, the Olawaju, the United States of America sometimes likes to think it's the world, but I assure you there are many other nations. Yeah, we can kick all their rears, Kowalski said, looking at them through the center mirror. A clever system that, Rin thought, and how casually they used something so expensive as a mirror. America is just as dependent upon the rest of the world as the world is on America, Alunwaju said. Sure, Kowalski said, spitting into his bottle, but we could take the rest of the world in a fight. We've got the freaking most advanced and powerful military in the world. We spend as much on our military as the entire rest of the freaking world, combined. There are about 350 million people in the United States, Bradford said, cutting off Kowalski and Alan Raju, and nearly 8 billion people in the world. Rin felt his jaw slowly drop open and his ears sag to the side. Ah! How are there so many of you? Modern medicine, Edison said, leaning over the back of his seat. It lets most kids survive to adulthood, and most adults survive to old age. That, and public sanitation. This is true, Alan Wajuk chimed in, turning away from the window. In my home country of Nigeria, our history has not been so, um, fortunate as America. He frowned. Many of the medical wonders they consider to be commonplace are rare and hard to come by and much of my country still struggles to find clean drinking water. He gestured to his uniform. That is why I came to America and joined the United States Navy. I want to learn to be a doctor so that I can help my people at home. Ren rolled his ears back from where they had sagged, flicking an ear back to his briefly pondered the notion of a human wonders where not widespread. Does that make them more reliable with their own problems, or more terrible for neglecting their own people? Doc here is a navy, not a marine, Bradford said, misinterpreting his expression. All corpsmen are. Marines aren't smart enough to do our own medicine. Just patch them back together with superglue, I'll be fine, Kowalski said before spitting again. Rin shook his ears in amusement. Don't know what superglue is, but the sentiment is obvious. He stopped and tilted his head at Bradford again as a new question popped into his head. How long do humans live? Well, that depends on a lot of things, Bradford said, but assuming decent health care and nutrition and no accidents or major diseases, humans can reasonably expect to live for 70 to 80 years or more. Oldest person on record is 122 when she died, Gomez added. Rin flicked his ears up. As an important question to go along with that, Kimba interrupted Rin's thoughts, is how long is a year on Earth compared to a year on Galha? That is actually a damn good question, Edison said. I didn't notice if the days were any longer or shorter, but we haven't exactly been running on a regular cycle yet. How long is a day in Galha and how many days are in a year? Rin blinked. That is uh, an important question to ask. A day in Galha is 24 hours long. What? Same as ours, brah? That's too convenient, Edison shook his head. Why is that a problem? Gomez asked, twisting around in his seat to join the conversation. Dude, there's like 200 billion stars in our galaxy, Bradford said, stretching her hands out to indicate a huge size, most with multiple planets, and at least 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. The odds of two planets around two different stars would have exactly the same day of length as astronomical. She shook her head, never mind the possibility that other universes. Rin stared at her, struggling to comprehend the words and concepts that she had just spoken. That's more stars than there are in the night sky. What do stars have to do with anything? And how can a planet be around a star? His ears went pat. What secrets do they know that they haven't shown yet? What secrets do they know that they haven't even thought to mention? How long is an hour? Mill asked, cutting off the rousing argument. Rin? Bradford looked at him expectantly. That question I can answer. Sixty minutes. Hmm, how long is a minute? 60 seconds. Crap. How long is a second? Uh, well, Rin scratched his ear. Well, the measurement of seconds is still fairly new, and most families can barely afford a clock, if at all. Never mind a pendulum clock. What about this? Edison asked, taking a band off of his wrist and holding it up for him to see. He pressed a button on the side, eliciting a high-pitched tone of the hearing test machine that set Rin's ears twitching. What is... 
Rin's eyes went wide as his ears perked up as he took in the steadily changing symbols displayed in its face. Is this... He reached out and gently touched the face of it. This is a clock. Yeah, well, we call it a wristwatch or just a watch. Edison put it on his hand. Here, you can keep it. But how much did this cost? This would be worth a king's ransom in Ganlin. Um, I think it cost me like, um, 40 bucks. Edison shrugged. It's not expensive. I'll just pick up another one at the MCX. Rin's ears dropped low. What miracles have they that they think nothing of? Thank you. Edison shrugged. It's nothing, man. Examining the watch, Rin tilted his head. What is it doing? It just seems to be counting. Oh yeah, sorry, that's the stopwatch function. A few moments later, and Rin had a basic understanding of how to operate his new watch. Not that I can actually read any of the numbers on it, beyond telling what are seconds, minutes, and hours. It looks like your second is about the same. I'm not sure. An idea came to him. Hold on. He concentrated for a moment, drawing on the ambient manner to spin a minor artifice. Without his staff, the simple spell required significant concentration to perform. With the staff, the energy isn't that instantly there, so you have to pull the artifice one step at a time. Controlling structures first, then we need mana to do the work. Don't need to make myself look like a novice and have a simple spell blow up in my face. I'm limited to just how the ambient mana I can draw in myself. So, such a mistake shouldn't be catastrophic, but the mana seems to flow here as easily as it does back home. Something important to note for later. Holding out his left hand, a faint, crude image of a clock appeared, this one with Talesh characters marking the time. Three arms spun around the face of the clock. Oh damn, that's a neat trick, Edison said, leaning over at the back of the seat to inspect the projection. How precise is it? As precise as we can determine, Rin said, it is driven by the base harmonic frequency of all manner, which doesn't change. I can't hold the artifice like this for very long without it must starve, though. He glanced at Edison, holding out his watch. Oh, right. Edison took the watch again and reset the stopwatch. Mark me at ten seconds, Rin nodded. Tell me when to go. Ready, go. Edison hit the stop button as the tiny beep right in the second arm and Rin's projection reached the top of the clock. Stop, Rin called out, out ten seconds later. Damn, Edison said, holding up the watch for Rin and Bradford to see. Almost exactly ten seconds, give or take a human reaction time. So about the same, Bradford frowned. That's too damn convenient. Well, how long is your year? Ren asked, dismissing the artifice and giving her attention to both ears. 365 and one quarter days. Our calendar year is 365 days, with a leap year every fall that adds up in February. Ha! He clicked his fingers at her. Ours is 363 and four fifths. The royal calendar is 364 days long. The last day of every fifth year. Well, damn, maybe they're not exactly identical, Bradford said. Wouldn't it make sense for them to be close, Samson asked. If Ganon made the portal to flee to a new world, wouldn't they try and find one that was close to theirs as they could? Yes, yes we would, Ren said. Discussions on the concept of other worlds often included the possibility of other worlds would have days much shorter or longer than ours, or the suns that set in the east and rose in the west, or no sun at all. All right, you freaking nerds, we're almost there. Kowalski said from the van came to a stop. Get your IDs ready. The van accelerated again as he spun the wheel to the left, and they accelerated around another curve that connected the another highway. Rin looked about as the humans all began digging unusual purses out of various pockets and pulling out little cards with ultra-realistic portraits of them. He eyed Bradford's card. I don't have one of those. It's fine, the guards at the gate probably won't even notice you, and we'll be escorting you anyway. She looked at the window behind them as the van straightened its course, pointing. You ever see anything like that before? Rin turned and looked past the highway, past an unbelievably tall building to a wide, open, endless expanse. His ears perked up as his brow raised. That's water! I've never seen an ocean before! And here I am, staring at one on a different world. That's the Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean on Earth. It's the widest point, and stretches halfway around the world. He blinked, trying to imagine the scale, and they were leaving the highway the ocean disappeared from view. 
Ahead, the van slowed as they approached the large gate structure over the road. They slid into a line of cars. Ah, crap, they're in Charlie, Kowalski spit into his bottle. They might do more than just wave us through. Rin peered through the window at the gate ahead of them and saw multiple marines in body armor standing in each lane. Other marines flagged one vehicle off to the side and had the humans inside step out while they began searching through it. A few minutes later, it was their turn. Kowalski turned the music down and hit the button beside him that made the window lower on its own. Rin quirked an ear in curiosity, wondering how their artifices worked with no indication of mana usage. The vehicle ahead of them was allowed through, and then it was their turn. The van rolled forward and there was a squeal of metal as Kowalski brought them to a stop next to the guards. One was holding a rifle and stood back from the other, who just had a pistol. Both were the same sort of armor and the marines did when they were in combat. Kowalski passed his portrait card to the guard. I'm going to need to see all of them, the marines said, flipping the card around and presenting it to the handheld artificing tool. The artifice beeped and the marine held the card against the scanner for a moment while Kowalski reached back and collected the rest of the cards. One of our guys doesn't have an ID, but we're escorting him, he said as he handed the rest of the IDs over. The marine nodded, presenting another card to the van bleeped. He glanced in the van and did a double take when he saw Rin. Holy crap, is that a... Yes, Kowalski said, picking up the bottle to spit in. We are taking him to the hospital for x-rays and MRIs. The sentry flagged another marine over. Freaking hell, corporal, what do you think of this? He pointed at Rin. They're taking him to medical. Holy crap. The corporal stared at the window, making Rin shift uncomfortably. The marine with the rifle stepped over to stare as well, while the first guard resumed the beeping cards. Bradford pulled a piece of paper out of his breast pocket and unfolded it, passing it forward. This is the second artificer I yet. He's been in Gandon Specialist embedded in my squad, authorized by General Langston himself. The corporal took the paper and glanced it over, his eyebrows shut up. That's more stars than I need to see, he said, passing it back. As long as one of you is escorting him at all times, you're good to go. Kowalski raised his split bottle and salute before setting it aside and collecting all the cards. He passed them to Gomez as the first guards waved them through. Never thought I'd see an alien in real life, Rin heard as they pulled away. Here, keep this, Bradford said, passing him the paper. Forget to give it to you earlier, it's a copy of the order attaching you to our squad. He took it with a nod. We're stopping at the MCX first, Kowalski asked, and Rin debated about which pocket to put his chit in. There are so many pockets. Bradford glanced at her own watch. Yeah, Rin's gonna need some clothes and some other stuff, but I don't want to go ham, stocking up and crap. We still gotta get to the barracks, cleaned up and back here by ten. This is fine, Kowalski spit into the bottle and used it to point in the direction of a large as castle as they drove past. We'll be coming right back here. We can make our supply run while you and Shields are playing doctor. Bradford narrowed her eyes at Kowalski before rolling them in a dismissal of whatever his comment meant. Yeah, that works. They passed the large field paved with stone, with the hundreds of carriages of all sorts were parked in the room of hundreds more. Just past the paved field was what Rin figured was a hospital. They turned into another paved field. Unless there is something you need back in the barracks, we don't need to all go in, Bradford said. We don't have a whole lot of time to waste. Oh, some of us can definitely coming in, Samson said. We're not going to leave our boy here at the mercy of your sense of style. What's wrong with my sense of style? I have a good sense of style. Yeah, for a chick, Kowalski said. Somebody needs to show him how to dress like a man. Am I going to have to have an intervention with you two? Samson asked. Samson, no offense, buddy, Edison said, turning around with an apologetic look at his face, but the gay sense of style skipped a generation with you. He's not wrong, Alan Waju nodded. I've seen the way you dress. The rest of the squad nodded in agreement. And frick all you guys. All right, who's all coming in with us? Bradford asked with a smile. I am, Kowalski said as he parked the van between two white lines painted on the ground. He moved the lever next to the steering wheel and opened the door. Keep the engine running, Goma. Kimber and Edison exchanged glances. We're coming. I'm staying, Mitter said, leaning back in his seat and closing his eyes. I have nothing I need, Alamwaji said, shifting in his seat to allow Kimber to slide by him. 
Somebody's got to rein those three in, Dewar said, sliding past the pouting Samson and working his way to the door as Bradford opened it. Rin climbed out of the van after Bradford, bending over to inspect the paving beneath their feet while the humans stretched. It's called asphalt, the boss said, hopping out. It's gravel mixed with hot bitumen, and it's compressed with a heavy rolling machine. Rin picked up the fine gravel with his nail. Bitumen? Thick tar springs from the ground. I know what bitumen is, Rin said, flicking his ears in annoyance. I was studying basic artificing at the University of Yagyahanai when the third drop fell. You have one of those experiments too, Bradford asked. Our most famous one had the ninth drop of a few years ago. Let's go, nerds, Kowalski said, walking around the van. Or are you going to stare at the pavement all day? Dubois rolled his eyes and the group fell in and headed for the large building. I'm going inside a human building, Rin thought, his tail flicking in excitement as they walked. Do they have tar fields or are you refiner from oil? Dubois asked. Rin flicked his ear at him. The young Hanai sample came from the tar fields of Dujahai in the northeast corner of the kingdom. Wait, he stopped mid-step, turning to look at Dubois. What do you mean, refiner from oil? Crude oil, man, Dubois said. Distill it like alcohol and you can refine it into all sorts of things, from bitumen to high-octane jet fuel, and everything in between. He gestured around them. Hell, all of our entire civilization runs on oil. Rin flicked his ears as they continued considering. So, if we had oil, you could use, um, you have oil. There are places where it seeps out of the ground in my home province. He gestured at himself and his dark fur. It's a common joke that the Kishman from Yintar are stained with it. Sounds like Yintar needs some motherfucking freedom, Kowalski said, puffing his chest out. Rin opened his mouth to question his definition of freedom when the doors that they were approaching slid open on their own. His ears and eyes swung to the door, following his head. Keep walking, Bradford said, giving him a nudge in the back. They're automatic doors. They have motors triggered by motion sensors. Are you sure you don't have magic because, um... He trailed off as they continued into the MCX and stared about at the wonders laid before him. He heard Edison say something about technology indistinguishable from magic but wasn't paying attention. It's a giant market... He slowly looked about. There's so many things. There are moving pictures on that wall. Earth to shields. Radford waved a hand in front of his face, snapping him out of his reverie. Welcome to America, bud. Come on, shields. Time to get some proper clothes, Edison said, waving him towards an endless array of clothing racks. Rin started to follow, but was halted by a sudden realization. I, I don't have anything to pay for any of this. Ah, don't worry about it, man. We got you, Kimber said, throwing a heavy arm over his shoulder. You saved all our rears back at the camp. At least we can do is buy you some proper duds. Rin flicked his ears back inside, following along Kimber and Edison. I don't have a choice in this, uh, do I? Nope. Kimber lifted his arm and gave a hearty snap on the back, nearly sending him tumbling forward as the other men fell in around him. We'll meet you in the register's jabs. Kowalski said, grabbing a large basket on a wheeled frame as Edison turned to lead them down the aisle. Have fun playing dress-up, Radford laughed. Just make sure to get him some toiletries, too. One whirlwind tour of the Marine Corps exchange and a brief explanation in paper currency and the credit cards later, Rin found himself walking back to the van. The proud new owner of no less than three complete changes of clothes, two packs of boxes, three packs of socks, and a pack of toothbrushes and a holder, and three tubes of toothpaste of assorted flavors, a deodorant stick, a bottle of cologne, and a pair of sneakers, which apparently aren't for sneaking, a dog brush, a bottle of regular shampoo, and a bottle of dog shampoo, a loofah, which was apparently for scrubbing, and a towel and an assortment of tools and field supplies that the marines recommended. All that Ridden recognized as useful. They even had a fine sandpaper and polishing cloth and the oil in the hardware section. No more concha reeds and river eel scales for this Kishman. So why are there so few people? He asked, looking up from the bags he was carrying. That is such a large market shop. He shook his head. So many new concepts that needed new words. But we were the only ones there except for the people maining the registers. He struggled a bit with the human word, but felt he managed to get it mostly right. Well, we got there just right when they were opening, so it's all pretty early, Dubois shrugged. 
and most of the bases at a portal are on the other side of it. The woman at the register didn't seem particularly surprised to see me, Red said as they approached the van. They saw you when you came in, Bradford said, rolling her eyes. I had to explain to them why you were here and why they got all their surprise out of their system then. Ah, Run said as he opened up the van doors and started the awkward process of climbing back. Everyone who left insisted on having the seats they started with, so much to the grumbling of those who had not moved to let them in. Piling his bags into the space between the front seats and the second row of seats, Run slid into the window seat, Bradford following him, shutting the door behind. Barracks, Kowalski asked, looking at Bradford in the mirror as he started the van. Barracks, she nodded. Aye, Kowalski said, yanking the lever behind the wheel down, and they were off. Hey, Rin, Gomez said, turning around to look at him. We were talking about the human Kishman ages before. How long do Kishman live, and how old are you? Rin looked up from his bag as he was rummaging through. Well, the oldest Kishman I've known was our Tylan, and he was healing Artificer in my village when I was young. He was 84 when he passed away. His ears flicked down as he scratched behind one. The oldest Kishman I've heard of was Master Riel, one of the artificers at Yagi Hane. He was 102 when he passed away while giving an exam to a class. Rin snorted. His ears flicked up in amusement. They say that he was such a tyrant of a professor. His students sat in his class for three hours before someone went to go wake him up and found him dead. Oh, damn, Edison said, leaning forward to rest his arms on the back of Rin's and Bradford's seat. You know, I think I've known a professor or two like that, Bradford said, smiling at the memories. Pfft. You and your fancy education. Edison rolled his eyes. Bradford just smiled. So, how old are you? He asked, tapping Rin's shoulder. I've seen 24 summers. How old are you? I'm 22, Kowalski. Up there is 24. He'd be a sergeant by now if he hadn't been an EJP'd three times. Freck you. EJP'd, Rin said. Acronym for non-judicial punishment, Bradford said. Kowalski got himself into enough trouble that he got busted down to rank for it three times. Only twice, Kowalski objected. The second time was just that suspended bust. Bradford shook her head and with a smile. I'm 18, Gomez said. Goddamn freaking baby boot is what you are, Kowalski said. We've all got boots that have more time in service than you do. Shut the frick up. Gomez turned around to pout out the window. Kimber here is 22 like I am, and he enlisted out of high school, so he's got an extra year in the service on me. That's not the only thing I've got on you, Kimber winked. Okay, Samson, Edison rolled his eyes. Hey, Samson said with Kimber and just grinned. Our token gay black man here, Edison continued, pointing his thumb over his shoulder, is 21. He checks multiple boxes in our diversity hire list. Samson showed his middle finger. Rin cocked a ear at that. That is, um... Not something I'm going to ask about right now. Scuba Steve is also 21. Brah, Stephen said, giving Rin a happy nod. Old Moody Miller over there is 23, but he got an even later start than I did. How many years of college did you do? Three, Miller said, gazing out the window at the road turned to reveal a large paved strip on the other side of the row of large buildings. Rin could see vipers and osprey sitting in rows. A pair of vipers lifted off as they drove past. Fascinated, Rin tried to watch as they flew overhead, clunking his horns against a window, and they stopped trying to angle his head to see when Bradford started laughing. He gave her a sidelong glance as he flicked his ears against his skull in embarrassment and retreated into the corner of his seat. Sorry, she said. You just look so, uh, she glanced away. Sorry. Rin saw everyone else van exchange glances, but wasn't proficient enough in human eye speak to understand their meaning. Anyway, O10 back here in the old man of the group. He's 26. O10. Rin glanced at Orlum Waju. Yeah, his name starts with O and has 10 letters in it. It's easier to pronounce than his name sometimes, Edison shrugged. Or we just call him Doc. Olin Rawaju gave him a shrug, and Rin rolled his ears in return. I'm older than most of you, Rin said, glancing around. His gaze settled on Bradford. What about you? How old are you? Oh boy, Kowalski said. Ain't you ever talked to a woman before? Never ask a woman her age. Most of my experience in talking to women have been in brothels, he said, and instantly regretted that Bradford smirked. 
You spent a lot of time in brothels, she asked, as a sly quirk of an eyebrow. I, um, uh, this is, um, uh, no? Rin retreated further into his corner, his ears flat against his skull. That doesn't sound very convincing, second artificer. Bradford gave him a devilish grin. Rin snapped his mouth shut and gave her a glare. Why am I bothered by this? He wondered. Further introspection was interrupted when the van swerved and jerked hard around a curve, bouncing him to his seat and sending him sliding into Bradford. Goddamn potholes! Kowalski growled as Rin extricated himself from Bradford's arms. And that is why we wear our seatbelt, she said with a smile, helping him back to his side of the seat. And so you don't give a flying through the windshield when we crash, she added, pitching her voice towards Kowalski as she gave him a glare. You mean, if... Kowalski said and as Rin retreated back into his corner and firmly buckled himself in. No, I don't. Well, frick you. Next time I'll let Goma drive. Really? Goma asked, poking up. Frick no. As the two continued their squabble, Bradford gave Rin a glance that was unmistakably calculating and mischievous. He gave her an uncertain look back, huddling into his corner, but after a moment's consideration she dismissed whatever she was thinking. So, she said, jumping back a few topics, how many Kishmen are there? Rin tilted his head, twisting an ear to face right behind him in uncertainty. He took a deep breath. According to the last census, the kingdom of Ganon ruled over roughly 80 million souls. Our neighboring kingdoms maybe numbered, uh, he shrugged, an ear, 20 million? Between the lot of them, that was before the war. He sighed, his ears drooping. Nobody knows how many have died in the war, and refugees make it even harder, but it's based on territory and troops that we've lost, he shrugged. The lowest estimates I have heard were in the millions. Damn, she said, looking like a regretted her shift in topics. Crap, man, Edison said. How many of the bastards have you gotten back? Kowalski asked. I, um, I don't know, Ren said, tilting his head. A lot, he scowled. Not enough. Don't worry, Kimber said, giving a shoulder a squeeze from behind. We'll help you kill all the bastards. Light every one of those sons of witches up and make them regret the day that they ever met the U.S. Marine Corps, Kowalski said. Hoorah! Hoorah! Answered the van. Rin smiled, relaxing out of the corner of his seat. These people really know how to keep their motivation going, he thought as Bradford gave his shoulder another squeeze. He smiled more. And here we are, home, sweet home, Hogan Barracks, Kowalski said as the van came to a stop at the end of a short side road. He spit in his bottle and spun the wheel as he pulled out of the intersection and slowly rolled past a row of parked carriages. Rin looked out his window at another set of towering buildings. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy, Edison said as Kowalski swung a van around and backed it into the empty slot across the street from the barracks. Or at least a sleazy den of barracks bunnies and STDs, Gimber said. Rin flicked his ears, ignoring yet another reference he had no context for. The doors opened and the marines piled out with stretches and curses. Bradford helped Rin haul all his bags out of the van and they all fell into a mob and headed across the street. So we get showered, cleaned up and grab whatever we need and meet back at... Uh, ah, crap, Kowalski said as he was interrupted by a bugle sounding da-da-da-da-da. In unison, the marines stopped and turned, snapping to attention and saluting. Caught, completely off guard and with no idea of what was happening, Rin struggled to spin around and shift the bags into his left hand. When in Kalakai, he thought, bringing up his right hand to his brow and mimicking the salute as the band started to play. In the distance, he saw a flag being run up a pole. They all stood at attention, holding salute, until the music ended. Following the example of the rest of the marines, he dropped the salute, but remained at attention until the bugle sounded again. Man, that figures, Gomez said as they turned back to the barracks. We're out there in the middle of a war zone, but we still get back to base in time to get caught in the freaking colors. Damn freaking right, Kowalski said, lifting his legs an extra wide as he walked. Gives me a freedom boner every freaking time. Makes me hard every time I see a freaking boot stand and salute. He tapped Rin's shoulder and the back of his hand. Hell, I bet even Shields got half a chub going, huh, Shields? Kowalski winked. Um, Rin flicked his ears back, giving him a sideways glance. The Marines all laughed. Anyway, meet me back at the van at nine, Kowalski asked as they walked into the door, looking directly at everyone else in the group. 
Yeah, Zero Nine should give us enough time to get back to the hospital by ten, Bradford said. Great, see ya. Kowalski turned, and two steps later Rin found himself alone with Bradford. They stopped, both looking about in surprise at the sudden disappearance of the rest of the squad. They're up to something, Bradford said. Eyes narrowed. She sighed. Frick it, she said, waving for him to follow her. Let's go get cleaned up. Rin glanced in the direction he last saw one of the marines and then hurried off to Bradford. She led him across the entrance to a set of silver doors. She pressed a button, and they stood in front of the door while it peeped at them and something rumbled on the other side. A moment later, it dinged and the door slid open. He followed Bradford into the small room on the other side of the doors, glancing about and turning around as she reached over and pushed another button on the inside of the room. Elevator she explained as the door slid shut. Wait for it, she said when she cocked an ear at her. A moment after the door shut, the car rumbled and he felt the inside sag as the floor was rising. His ears flicked up. We're going up? Yep, she laughed. Saves the trip up several flights of stairs. Symbols above the door counted up, and a few moments later his stomach fluttered as the elevator came to a halt. I think that's the number four. The doors dinged and slid open, and Bradford led him out into the new hallway. She turned, and he followed her down the corridor and around the corner. Halfway down another corridor, they came to a door with a number three on it. Bradford pulled out a card and used it on the unlock the door somehow, and it swung open. Come on in, she said, walking through the door and flicking the switch on the wall, causing the lights to come on. My roommate's in the battalion headquarters company, so we'll have the place to ourselves. Rin glanced about as he followed her in. They walked past and looked at a small kitchen and another door that was shut into a large common room. The furniture was arranged to make a clear divide, and Bradford walked over to one side, depositing the bags that she was carrying onto the crispy made bed. The walls and the top furniture were decorated in various pictures, some awards, and a few other items. A flag was hung on one wall, and the next it was a large picture of a strange air vehicle with the stubby wings attached to two narrow white cylinders with a large orange cylinder, rising up on a column of fire. I'll get showered first, she said, opening up the drawers and tall dresser and pulling out several articles of clothing. That way you can make whatever modifications you need to whatever you're going to be wearing. He nodded. That's sensible. There's cups in the kitchen and water in the tap if you're thirsty. She pointed a thumb at the first room they had passed. We were gearing up to spend a few days in the field before this all went down, so I hadn't bothered stocking up on groceries. She shrugged as she opened the door to the other room, flipping another switch on that caused more lights to come on. You're welcome to whatever there is. Make yourself comfortable. I'll be out in a minute. She shut the door behind her. Rin found himself alone. Glancing about, he set the rest of the bags on the bed and set to work breaking open the pack of boxes with a knife to modify them. The boxes were easy enough to open, holding a pair up. Rin decided they would be more comfortable than the whitey tighty skivvies Bradford had given him to the supply tent. The knife, on the other hand, proved to be much more challenging. Digging it out of the bag, he glanced at the door when he heard the sudden sound of shower running. Trying to not imagine what was going on on the other side of the door, he turned back to the knife and promptly ran into trouble getting it. I need a god's damned knife to get out of my god's damned knife, he thought, struggling to find a way to break open the hard, clear material. With a resigned sigh, he gave up on trying to pull or rip with his hands and began gnawing on the package in an attempt to tear it open. As he chewed on the packaging, he glanced about at the pictures and portraits that were hung and propped up about the room. So many of them are true to life, like, um, I wonder what magic they used to make such perfect pictures. Most of the pictures featured Bradford and several other people who looked more like her than the other marines. One was Bradford in a very fancy uniform with a black jacket, trimmed in red and blue pants. She was surrounded by what Rin figured must be her mother and father and three brothers. Her father wore a similar uniform, but with many more decorations on his chest and sleeve. One of her brothers wore a uniform that was a solid dark blue, with a silver bar on each epaulette. Another picture was of Bradford and another woman standing atop a building and overlooking a straggling cityscape. Rin paused his chewing and inspected the picture more closely. That? That can't be real. They look like they're a mile in the sky. And there are buildings that are taller. And there are so many of them. So densely packed. 
He shook his head, tearing himself away from the photo, and renewed his efforts at gnawing through the packaging. Or maybe it's real. The wonders they have, that they have just take for granted. Ah ha! He cried as he finally chewed through enough of the packaging to get it apart. He pulled out his new knife and chucked the packaging onto the bed and flapped his ears in disgust. Sitting down on the chair that had a convenient gap at the back for his tail, he took a moment to examine the knife, carefully unfolding it and refolding the blade before he set it delicately cutting a hole in his new boxes for his tail. He heard the door open and he held his newly modified boxes up for inspection. I'll have to resew them later to keep them from coming completely undone, but this should do for now. Ready for your turn, Bradford said. Yeah, I think I... Uh -huh. Rin said as he turned around and find Bradford standing behind him, drying her hair with a towel, wearing nothing more than another towel. He kept right on turning until he was facing away from her again. You're naked. No, I'm not, she said, laughing. I'm wearing a towel with nothing underneath. Rin laid his ears flat against his head to keep them from betraying him with deciding to be thoroughly examine the strange disc and cylinders looking object that was set on the stand on a dresser. He had no idea what it was, but it struck him as a craft of some sort. His tail was rigid behind him, except for the tip, which twitched in agitation. And I don't have anything on underneath my regular clothes either, but you don't freak out about that. But that's... that that's different. It's not appropriate to think about such things. Not really, Bradford laughed again, tossing one of the towels over the back of the chair. Rin desperately hoped it was the one that she'd been drying her hair with. Look, Ayat, she sighed, you're going to have to get over the fact that I'm a woman. Chivalry is nice and all, but in the field, modesty quickly becomes more hassle than it's worth. She placed her hand on his shoulder and pulled. He cursed the parts of himself that let her turn him around. Thankfully, she was still wearing the other towel, but he still made a point of locking eyes onto hers and looking at nothing else. They are very interesting eyes, anyway. We're going to be in the field together, fighting beside each other, sleeping beside each other, crapping beside each other. When the bullets are flying and the bad guys are trying to make us dead, it's not going to matter. And we're not going to have time to worry about who's got boobs or what either of us has between our legs. If you guys keep anything between your legs, she flipped a hand and half shrug. Makes sense? He nodded, still not breaking eye contact. Of course it makes sense. The realities of life on a march are much more the same for us as it is for you. It's just, uh, that I'm a girl. She finished for him, quirking an eyebrow at him. Yes, he sighed, his ears sagging. So, you're a guy, I'm a girl, we're both infantry, fighting a war with a bunch of evil owls to freaking kill. Does anything else matter? Renan closed his eyes and took a deep, calming breath, consciously forcing himself to relax. No, he said, opening his eyes and meeting hers once more. Good, she said, giving him a heartwarming smile before turning and jerking her head back towards the door in the bathing room. Now come on, grab your stuff and I'll show you how the shower works. As she walked away, she pulled her hair back over her shoulder, where the damp locks and angle just below the tops of her shoulder blades. Well, the fine muscles rippled underneath her skin as she moved and he realized that the raw mass of his shoulders was larger than his even with the fur. He pretended that his eyes didn't wander down as she followed her, and steadfastly refused to acknowledge that he liked what he saw. Inside the bathing room, Rin was surprised to discover a distinct lack of bathtub. A small room contained a counter and a wash basin, some cabinets, and a seat over a bowl of water, all of which made sense to him, though he marveled at the indoor plumbing. Such things were rare even for the wealthy. He quirked his ears to the narrow stall that stood in place of a bathtub, however, and waited for Bradford to explain the latest oddity. So, those knobs control the water flow, she said, turning one and then the other, producing a spray of water from the nozzle mounted near the top of the stall. Red is for hot, blue is for cold water. Adjust both for the desired temperature, and make sure that you shut the curtain so water doesn't splash everywhere. She turned them off. Water's free, so don't worry about using it, but don't take too long. We've only got so much time before we have to head to the hospital. Hot water? Rin asked, jumping under the distraction as Bradford knelt down to collect clothes that she had left on the floor. How long does that last? This big heat is constantly heating more, Bradford said, standing up with a bundle of laundry, so it never runs out, unless we lose power to the barracks. 
though they can get it overworked if everyone's showering at once. She turned and walked out of the room, pausing at the door. I assume you know how to use soap and water. We're not barbarians, he said, flicking his ears low and back, before rolling them forward, though some could probably stand to bath more than four times a year, he quipped. She gave him a sidelong glance, then burst out laughing as he tried to wink at her, only to send his face into a half spasm. I'll be out here if you need anything, she smiled, putting the door shut behind her. Rin smiled after her, and then turned to the set his bundle of items on the counter, sorting out the things that he'd need to bathe from the things they would need after. His contemplation of which shampoo to use was interrupted by a brief knock on the door. Hey, toss your clothes out before you get in the shower. I'll throw them in the quick cycle in the washing machine. Rin waggled his ears at the door and sighed. Sure, he said, setting the shampoo down, and began stripping off his clothes. After pulling off his skivvies, he gathered everything into a bundle as he could with one hand, boots and all, and stepped hinge side of the door. With his free hand, he opened it just far enough to lean around and toss the bundle out onto the floor, and quickly shut it again. Are all humans this, um, casual with each other? He wondered, leaning against the door. Shaking those concerns out of his pelt, he snagged the dog shampoo and loofah from the counter and stepped over to the shower. He turned both knobs and cautiously experimented with the temperatures with his free hand until he found a temperature he liked. Hot baths were a luxury for most Kishmen, very even outside the army, but Rin had had enough to know what temperature he could tolerate. Once he found that temperature, he stepped inside the stall, stepping around the steam of the water, and set his shampoo bottle on the loofah on the empty shelf, taking care to close the curtain behind him. Standing next to the torrent of water, Rin was struck by a sudden and desperate urge to pee. He stuck his head out the shower and looked at the water bowl privy. I've no idea how that works. He glanced at the door. He really didn't want to ask Bradford for help on this, but uh, he also really had to go. He pulled his head back into the shower and looked down and quirked his ear at the drain. It's all dirty water, he thought with a shrug. He took care to aim directly at the grate of the drain and let loose emptying his bladder. I knew I should have gone to relieve myself before we left. His business finished, Ren waited for a few moments to be sure the water had washed everything down the drain. Once satisfied that he had waited long enough, he took a deep breath and stepped into the stream, and nearly melted to the floor as the steaming water stoked into his fur. Gods above and gods below, he muttered, thunking his head against the wall and struggled to keep his knees from giving out. He turned to let the pounding water pour over his shoulders and had to physically brace himself against the wall as it began to ease the knotted muscles in his back. This is better than sex right now. Rin took several long minutes just to soak, letting the stress and tension just melt away as the water streamed through his fur, carrying dirt and grime with it. When he started to lose track of time, he dragged himself out of his stupor with a soft whine as the newly relaxed muscles told him just how much they'd ached. He forced himself to straighten and focus on figuring out how to open the bottle of shampoo, which was made of more of that damnable impenetrable material. Fearing that he would have to resort to teeth again, Rin was relieved to discover that the top of the cap popped up with a tiny little hinge. It only took him another minute to determine that the bottle was meant to be squeezed, and he soon had a large dollop of shampoo squirted onto a loofah. Setting the bottle down, he inspected the loofah to determine how best to use it. He shrugged, triggering an instinctive half-shake that sprayed water around the shower and set about scrubbing around his chest. He soon had a thick lather worked up, and soon, using the loofah on his other hand, he worked it through his rest of his fur, turned around and lathered up his back and the back of his head, squirting two more dollops of shampoo onto the loofah and to lather up his satisfaction. Properly soaked up, he began rinsing in earnest and used the opportunity for a relaxing soak as the suds and grime sluiced away. Rin continued to soak until he became so warm that he began to feel the need to pant, controlling the urge. He gave himself one final rinse down and turned the water off. After a moment's consideration, he experimented with turning on just the cold water to cool himself off. It worked marvelously, and he gave himself a quick cooling rinse before turning the water off and allowing himself to succumb to the urge to do a full body shake, rapidly expelling water from his pelt and spraying it all over the shower. 
The curtain was well justified. He gave himself another good shake and opened the curtain. Stepping out of the shower, he snagged the towel off the counter and began the process of drying the rest of the water out of his fur. A few more shakes and shudders later, and he felt like he was reasonably toweled off. Glancing around, he found a set of hooks with two other towels hanging from them and added his own. He turned back to the counter and realized that the only thing that he had to wear was his newly modified boxers. He stared at them for a moment, his ears level and fanned back in a sardonic angle. Well, this figures, he thought, looking at the hazy reflection of the fogged out mirror, which as large as it was didn't even break into the top five most extravagant things he'd seen that morning. Fine, modesty doesn't matter. What did Master Aitiyanyani say? Carry on with dignity, always. At least the red goes well with my fur. With a sigh, he donned on his boxes, gathered up his things, and marched out of the bathroom as his head held high. Took you long enough, Radford was sitting in her chair, a figure transformed. She wore a clean uniform, the same that she had worn before, but this one was free of wrinkles and not a thread appeared to be out of place. Her face was clean and clear and her eyebrows smooth, and her hair had been pulled back into a tight and crisp bun. Not a single hair was out of place. She gave him a knowing smile. Enjoy your first shower. I have never felt so clean in my life, he said, looking down at the silky sheen that he had brought out in the now mostly dry fur. Nor looked so clean. You definitely clean up nice, she said, standing up and giving him a glance up and down. Red suits you. You should wear it more. Rin glanced up at her and she gave him a smile and a wink. He flicked his ears at her. Come on, your clothes should be about done in the dryer, she said, gesturing towards the kitchen where a faint rumbling noise could be heard. It should be near the cool-down phase, but it should skip that. Cool-down phase? he asked, following her into the kitchen. Yeah, the dryer is basically a barrel that clothes get tumbled around inside, for a while, with hot air blown through, she said, walking up to a small tower with two sections stacked on top of each other. The top section was rumbling until she opened the door, revealing a spinning barrel and a tumbling clothes as the artifice that drove it died. It's great for drying clothes, but they can get pretty warm, so it cuts off the heat for a while and lets them cool down before it stops. She gathered the clothes inside into her arms once the barrel had stopped spinning and set them on the counter. It was mostly the uniforms that they had been wearing, but Rin recognized a few other items, including her unmentionables. Radford sorted through the pile, tossing him his clothes in turn. They were indeed clean, dry, and quite warm. Go ahead and throw those on. It's almost nine. Rin nodded, stepping around the corner to deposit his clothes on her bed and finish dressing, as much out of a need to use his arms as any sense of modesty. A few moments later, he was dressed in fresh, warm clothes that smelled cleaner than when they'd first got them. He met Bradford in a short hallway between the kitchen and the washroom, where she had stopped him and turned him to face the long mirror that hung on the wall. Damn, I do clean up good, he thought as he turned to admire his fur and how he looked at the dusty tan pattern of a marine uniform. He looked at his horns, reaching up as he run his hand along them. I just wish I had some time to polish them. I look like a wildling who dove horns first into a bumble batch. Here, yeah, we still have a few minutes, Bradford said, handing him his new brush. Make your hair pretty. Rin tilted in the air in her direction as she stepped out past him to the washroom, but flicked the concern away as he used a pristinely crafted mirror to help brush the fur around his head. But oh, damn, man, did you just shed all at once? She called from the washroom. There's fur completely clogging the shower drain. She made a noise of disgust, and he heard a sound of water gargling. A proper bath or a brush is a luxury we haven't really had the hat in a while, he said. The owls had pushed us right against the far bank of the last couple weeks, so we couldn't even have a dip in the water. Yeah, well, next time you can clean the head. She heard a brief sound of running water, and Bradford stepped back into the hallway. You about ready? With one final pass of the brush, he elevated himself in the mirror. I could almost pass for a prince if my horns were polished, and they didn't sweep back, of course. He gave himself a satisfied flick of the ears and turned to collect his things. Why does the sweep of your horns have to do with anything? They curve back, he said, reaching up with a finger to where the horns curved slightly to the tip. 
The royal family horns jog forward. He gestured with his hand to show the difference of the horns. The more pronounced the forward curve, the closer you are to the royal line of Kishman. Huh. Bradford stepped over to help him with the bag up his things and threw the packaging he no longer needed into the trash. Well, she said, giving him a pat on the back. You don't have to worry about any of that bullcrap over here. We kicked the nobility out almost two and a half centuries ago. Our government all elected officials. By the people. For the people. Of the people. She waved her hand as she quoted the phrase. He cooked his ear at her. That's a bizarre concept. Can you tell me more? Sure, she smiled. But later, we need to get you into the van to get to going to the hospital. Right, he said, looking down at the human watch strapped to his wrist as he followed her out the door. One day I'll be able to read what it says. The rest of the squad was already at the van, waiting for them. Though Gomez and Samson had both been walking across the stone yard in front of the barracks when they walked out. Freshly cleaned, spirits were high as they all piled back into the van. There was some shuffling of seats, but Kowalski still drove. Gomez was still sitting shotgun, while Rin and Bradford still sat next to each other. They exchanged jokes about everyone smelling pretty, and when Rin mentioned the polishing of his horns, Kimber suggested something called a Dremel and the power buffer. The conversation was interrupted, however, shortly after the van turned back onto the main road. Hey, everyone, shut up, Kowalski said, turning up the radio. Is an IBC News report. The deep voice shook over the urgent sounding tune. U.S. forces launched a first offensive against the Elven Empire Wednesday afternoon. An enlightening raid and show of force against the two Elven Ford bases. Special war correspondent Brad Malski has more. The man who spoke next sounded slightly garbled, as if whatever artifice that was recording his words was having some trouble. He spoke quickly, as if he had limited time to deliver his information. Wednesday afternoon, Marines of the 2nd Battalion, 5th Regiment were deployed in an attack on two elven camps identified by aerial recon as the bases of operations for the elven forces that participated in a major battle on Tuesday. The camps were then taken by minimal resistance, with as much trouble coming from the elves' advanced camouflage techniques as from the elven forces themselves. The northern camp saw no further action, but at its southern camp came under attack by what I'm told was an advanced enemy element of surviving Alban forces from Tuesday's battle. The Owls brought one of their walking shield towers with them and managed to catch the Marines off guard. Fighting was fierce, and the Marines suffered several casualties, including an osprey that had just landed, but several Marines and Kishman specialists pushed inside the shield under heavy fire and took the tower out with a shoulder-mounted rockets. Brick, yeah, that's us, Kowalski crowed. Hey, man, they mentioned you in the news, Kimber said, giving Rin's shoulder a shake from behind. Shh, shh. Kowalski hushed everyone as the correspondent continued. We're driven back under heavy fire by close our support of marine attack helicopters and F-18s and Air Force warthogs. I can say with certainty that the previous accounts of elves using prisoners as living shields are more than accurate. I saw with my own eyes several Kishman prisoners chained to the tower, including children, literally having their lives sucked out of them, just as disturbing where their large pens had clearly held hundreds, if not thousands of prisoners located in each camp, both of which were empty. After repelling the counterattack, the Marines removed significant stockpiles of captured equipment and materials before Air Force bombers leveled both camps. Military commanders have been tight-lipped about the what kind of intelligence and equipment was captured, but the general impression, given that they have been hard-pressed to make heads or tails of it, and whatever magic drives the Alvin technology, will undoubtedly require significant study. The deep voice returned. Brad Milesky is an ABC News Special War Correspondent, currently embedded in Echo Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment. Stay tuned in ABC News for up-to-the-minute updates on the ongoing portal crisis and the war with the Owls. This has been ABC News Special Report. Look at that man, you're already Earth famous, Kimber said, giving Rin's shoulder another pat. Yeah, next thing you'll know you'll be in D.C. shaking hands with the President, Edison said. Just don't bend over and show them the battle scars on your ass, Dubois quipped, giving him a pat on the shoulder. Rinzius picked up in alarm. Who is the president and why would anyone show him the rear? Hey, now some people might like to see his rear, Kowalski said, winking at them in the mirror. 
Let's not introduce him to the furries just yet, Bradford rolled her eyes. He's had enough trauma for one week. What's a furry? Everyone groaned. Gomez grinned, turning around to speak. We'll explain later, Bradford said, cutting him off before he could get a word out. I'm not having this conversation right now. She glared at Gomez. His face fell, and he turned back around in his seat. I wonder what they'll be able to learn from all that magic crap we captured. Edison said, we could do some pretty fucking crazy stuff with it if we could just do what the elves and shields here have done with magic, and we definitely need some kind of defense against the elves' magic. Especially if they've got any kind of mind control, Miller said, still staring out of his window. You know, shields, come to think of it, you never did tell us why mind control isn't a thing, Samson said. If magic exists, why can't they be like, I cast a spell on you? He sang, waggling his fingers at Rin, and have us at their mercy. Yeah, how are we going to deal with the elves if they're going to be running around casting dominate person on all of us in the middle of a fight? Bradford asked. Because mind control doesn't really exist, Rin said, shaking his head. Not like that, at least. How can it not? Edison said. We can frick with people's heads without magic, and that translation spell literally implanted knowledge into our brains. No, it didn't, Rin said with a calm flick of his ears. Then how the frick can we understand you? Listen to my words. Concentrate on my meaning. Does it feel like you know what I'm saying, or like someone else is suggesting a meaning in your head? Now that you mention it, Edison proud, it does feel like more like someone else is telling me the meaning. That's exactly what is happening. The translation artifice was not an instant transfer of knowledge. It's still active now, powered by ambient manner, actively translating for you. So, can't that still be used to control minds? Kimba asked. You could still putting words into people's heads. In a way, yes, but not in the way that you're thinking. Rin tugged on his horn, trying to think of how best to explain advanced concepts to a layman. Minds are complex things. Interacting with them without destroying them is a lot of very fine control of mana, which means it takes a lot of mana to get the fine control. So... Any kind of mind-affecting artifice is extremely manner-intensive from the start. He rolled his ears. And that's assuming you even know anything about how the mind works in the first place. The greatest artifices can intuit framework and do amazing things, but even those pale in comparison to the complexity of a conscious mind. He shook his head. On top of that, even if you have the manner and understanding of how to effectively interact with a mind, influencing conscious minds is not easy. The more assertive that influence is, the easier it is to recognize and ignore. He sighed, struggling to find words to explain concepts that he himself was not most familiar with. Now, it is not my field of expertise, but in theory, if you set someone down on a surgeon's table and carefully played with their mind, you could influence their behavior. Doing that outside of a very controlled environment, however, Rin shook his head. What about screwing with someone's head over time? Samson asked. Like put a little suggestions or words in their head and make them think that they're crazy or disrupt their sleep. I had a girlfriend who tried to do that, Dubois said. Woke up in the middle of the night to hear her whispering things in my ear. Like, you will always love me and you will do anything for me and you will always leave the seat down. That's wrecked up, brah. Yeah, we didn't stay together much long after that. He nodded at Run. What about that sort of thing? Rin tilted his head with a flick of his ears. That could work. The translation spell kind of does the same thing. He tapped his finger on his ear with the temple. Over time, the mind learns the suggestions, meanings, and the translation becomes redundant. But uh, once you know what to look for, spotting such spells is easy, and it's easy to disrupt them. He shook his head. Fine control artificery is like an extremely delicate and very sensitive to even slight disruptions. So if our translation spells were disrupted, we couldn't be able to understand each other anymore, Bradford asked. No, we wouldn't. Rin shook his head. We need another translation spell if we hadn't learned each other's language yet. So what's stopping the owls from just mass disrupting our translation spell and curtailing our ability to communicate effectively with each other? Rin shrugged. Nothing. They would need to think of it, of course. It's normally her consideration on the battlefield, and their own invisibility spells would be disrupted by it too, so it's not part of their normal arsenal. But they are certainly capable of such disruptions. So we could lose our ability to coordinate with you at any time. Yes, though only for a short-term concern. 
Now that the artifice has been created, it can be copied and applied again, though preferably on a smaller, more efficient scale. He waggled his ears. It's not something I could do myself, not without considerable study and practice, but a properly trained artificer should be able to do it with relative ease. Well, that's a relief then, Radford nodded. So, Kowalski asked, frowning in the mirror, if it takes a lot of energy to try and play with someone's head without frying their brain, why don't the elves just, um, fry our brains? He paused to spit on the bottle. Kind of hard to fight if someone liquefies your brains. Because creating and casting such a specific artifice takes a lot of concentration and manner, especially at range. It usually is a lot easier and way more efficient just to throw a spell burst in your face. He gave a remarkable expressive frown and nodded in the mirror. That's fair. A conversation for the rest of the trip across the marine base drifted back to the subject of dremels and polishing horns, with all the requisite innuendo and ribald jokes with most everyone in the van. Rin showed Kimber what he had picked up at the MCX and what was involved in properly polishing one's horns, and Kimber promised he would pick him up just the thing for him while they were getting scanned. Kowalski dropped Rin and Bradford off at the hospital, while he and the rest of the gang went back to the MCX to properly stock up. Rin looked up at the hospital as the van pulled away. Bradford gave the rest of her squad a suspicious glance as they left, then turned to let Rin inside with a wave. They're going to clean out the MCX and sell it all to the rest of the battalion at exorbitant rates. She winked at Rin over the shoulder. Not that I wouldn't do the same thing. Inside the hospital, Bradford led Rin across the waiting area to the counter where the nurse sat. The whole place looked impeccably clean. It smelled sterile. The nurse looked up as they approached and did a double take at Rin. We have an appointment for x-rays and an MRI, Bradford said, grabbing his attention before he could speak. Commander Jenkins should have had it over from Tolkien. Rin was suddenly even more glad that she had accompanied him. Her impeccable appearance made her hard-edged tone downright intimidating. Right, um, radiography is at second desk. He pointed at a set of doors and Rin now recognized as elevators. Take the left out of the elevator and straight ahead. You'll go right past it. Thank you, she nodded. Right, um, I'll call ahead and let them know you're on your way, he said, picking up a slender artifice out of the holder on his desk. Um... Sergeant Bradford, she said. Sergeant Bradford and second artificer I yet. Right, he said, snagging the artifact and the crook of his shoulder and reaching down to press a series of buttons on the holder. Bradford turned and walked away without a second glance. Rin followed her, trying to mimic her poise. He was mostly successful. A short elevator ride later, Rin handed his medical record to another nurse who seemed a little more prepared for his arrival. She directed him to have a seat in a small waiting area and a technician would get right with them. They sat down and waited, and continued to wait. Deciding he didn't want to just wait passively, Rin looked at his watch. Hey Jabs, he said, tentatively trying her nickname. Hmm? She looked over at him. Can you show me what these numbers are? Sure. She pulled a small pan of paper and a stick out of her breast pocket on her uniform and leaned over so that he could see what she wrote. Do you guys have base 10 number system? He held up his hands and flexed his fingers in sequence. Like 1, 2, 3, and so on to 10. Yep. She clicked the stick with her thumb and started drawing sets, ticks, marks on the paper, making 10 sets in total, in two rows. That's an ink pen. Where's the ink pot? Rin blinked as he flicked his ears at the minor miracle of self of contained pen. There were more important things being discussed. Then yes, we do. Thought you might. We both have ten fingers. Makes sense that we both use base ten number system. Makes it easy to count on your fingers. Rin nodded. That makes sense. Yep, it makes this easy too. The set's complete. She started writing down symbols above each of them. Oh, she said, stopping at five o'clock to look up at him. Do you guys have a mathematical concept of zero? What? Rin frowned, pulling his head back. The concept of nothing being a number like, um, I have a pen, she held it up. But if I had no pens, it would have zero pens. I know what zero is, he said, flicking his ears in annoyance. I was just expecting a question. Why is it important? Ah, sorry. She gave him a sheepish grin. Well, zero is very important. There's a lot of higher math stuff that you can't do without it. Also, this is our number for zero. 
She drew a circle above the ordered sets. It's also important here because... She quickly finished writing with the other numbers. Our symbol for 10 is 1 followed by a 0. So, use the standard royal notation then, he said, nodding. What? She asked, and Rin smiled now that it was her turn to be confused. Standard royal notation. Numbers are written with sets of 1s, then 10s, and then 100s, and so on. Ah, you mean positional notation, she nodded. Yeah, that's been the most common mathematical notation system for centuries. She tilted her head. Do you guys go left to right, she said, writing on a single tick mark that was a human one, followed by several zeros, or right to left. She moved down the line and wrote several zeros, followed by a one. We write left to right, he said, pointing at the first one. No, oh, that makes it super easy then, she grinned. It's just a straight substitution of symbols. Further discussion was curtailed by the arrival of the doctor and two nurses. Sergeant Bradford, second artificer I yet, the doctor said, extending his hand. Bradford stood and shook it in a human way, and Wynne followed her example. I'm Dr. Kensington, and this is HM2 Crowley and HM3 Reynolds, he said, gesturing at the two nurses. They exchanged greetings. If you would follow us, HM3 will get you ready for your x-ray. How is this going to work? Wynne asked as he and Bradford fell in behind him. Bradford repeated his question after a moment's delay, falling back into her role as a translator. We don't have a full body x-ray machine, so we'll do it in stages so that we can get images of your entire skeleton, Kensington said. And how does that work? Well, um, Kensington paused, looking at the way to explain the concept. How much do you know about light? Bradford asked. What does light have to do with anything? Light has everything to do with it, she said. The light you see is what is called a visible spectrum, Kensington said, nodding thanks to Bradford for the starting point but it is only a tiny portion of a full spectrum of light. Most of it you can't see because it passes right through you. Some frequencies only pass through certain things. So, you're going to shine a light that I can't see through my body. In a nutshell, yes, he nodded. X-rays are stopped by solid objects like bone, but don't interact much with softer tissues. Now, how does that help if you can't see it? They stopped outside the room and Reynolds stepped inside, gesturing for him to follow as Bradford echoed the question. We used to be used a specially treated film that reacted when exposed to x-rays, he said, but now we have more advanced sensors, so we can skip the chemical bars and just print it straight onto a computer. Rin followed her in, nodding and understanding at the basic concept. I'm not sure what printing from a computer means, but I suppose we have artifacts that have no concept of, either. He was directed to stand in front of the construct and given a ridiculously heavy sheet to cover the parts of him that were not being x-rayed. Above and below, this is heavy. What is this supposed to do? It's a lead sheet. It blocks x-rays to minimize your radiation exposure, Reynolds said. X-rays are what we call ionizing radiation, and they can cause damage to your cells, the basic structure of your body if you're exposed to too much of them. So this is dangerous, Ren asked. His ears flicked up in alarm. Not in the exposure levels that you'll be receiving, she reassured him, but radiation exposure is cumulative over time, so we minimize how much you're exposed to. So it's safe then? Perfectly safe, she said as she stepped behind a wall and everyone else left the room. If it's perfectly safe, then where is everyone going? Minimizing exposure, Bradford called from the hallway. Hold still, please, Reynolds said. Ren frowned, his ears flicking low, but he complied. He heard a brief click from the construct in front of him. Then Reynolds stepped around the wall and directed him to a new position. They repeated the process several times. Each time Reynolds stepped behind this wall and heard a click. And then Rin couldn't help but feel his skin start to crawl. It's all in your head. Don't get worked up. When Reynolds stepped around the wall and told him that he had taken the last one, his ears sagged in relief. And he quickly but calmly left the room. All done? Bradford asked, looking up from the conversation with the other nurse, Crowley. Yes, Rin said, doing the best to maintain his dignity while also putting as much space between him and the x-ray room as he could. For all I know, too much exposure will make all my fur and my face melt off. Mr. Ayat, Kensington stepped around the corner. If you could step over here, we can show you the x-rays. Rin glanced at Bradford, flicking his ears at Kensington's direction. He sighed in relief when she moved to follow him. They're starting to pick up her basic ear gestures. Finally! 
Together, they followed Kensington into another room, this one with several thin box set up. They're like the moving picture boxes in the MCX. A few years ago it would have taken us a couple days to get these back, Kensington said as he sat down in a chair with the built-in wheels. Ren quirked an ear at the ingenious use of it as he told a small device. But now everything's digital, gets read straight by the computer, so with a few minor clicks. The doctor moved his device to make a click several times, and the picture boxes changed. A box inside the box popped up, and then the screen was pulled with an image of a skeleton. His skeleton. We can pull all of your x-rays up right away. More images appeared and he recognized all of the different poses that he'd been put through. Above and below, he muttered. Reaching out to touch the images, an involuntary shudder rippled down his spine as he examined his own bones. Your skeletal structure is definitely not human, Kensington said. There are many similarities, he said, pointing at a few different spots on the images. Convergent evolution, no doubt. There are only so many efficient ways to create an upright biped with two arms, after all. He glanced at Rin with a flip of his hand before pointing at several other spots on the screen. But there are some big differences, too. His fingers trailed off to the image of Rin's shoulder and down his arm. If our fundamental biologies are in any way similar, I'd say you broke your arm, right here. He pointed at a specific point on halfway up Rin's upper arm, probably in childhood. I did, Rin said, when I was ten. I was trying to pick up some yabbas and fell out of a tree. His ears flicked back against his skull as he glanced at the side. It wasn't our yabba tree. Bradford laughed before adding to the translation. He looked back at the image, leaning forward in closer inspection. How did you know? This line right here, he said, pointing at the thin, slightly whiter line at that angled across the bone. In humans, you'll see scarring like that at a break site. He nodded. That's good. That's a sign that we have a lot of similarities on the inside. It's more likely our medicines will be compatible. He pointed at the shadowy shapes inside Rin's ribcage and abdomen. Not everything will be compatible, even with the best scenario. Soft tissue doesn't block x-rays nearly as much as denser bone structures, but you can still see the faint shapes and positions of several of your organs, and I'm pretty sure that you have a few that don't match up to ours at all. Rin nodded. All of this made sense. It's amazing that we're similar as we are. Some of the speculation of life on different worlds thought that we would be completely different, like fish and rocks. Or maybe not so surprising, considering we created a portal. The tip of his ears twitched ever so slightly. I should probably not talk about that around just anyone. Kensington looked up from the study Rin skeleton. Are there any questions you have about any of this? He indicated to the images with a hand. You obviously don't have any immediate injuries. We can't really tell you much more without time to properly study this. Of course, he nodded. I'm ready for the MRI, he tilted his head. Whatever that is. The doctor smiled. I'll let you take care of this, Reynolds, he said, standing up from the chair. And if you'll follow me and the HM2, we'll explain it on the way. A short walk on the elevator ride later, and Rin found himself reading as he tried to wrap his head around the new concept of electromagnetism. He was familiar with magnets, and he knew the base properties. He knew how they interacted with mana fields and how they could affect ambient mana. But this was a whole new field. Fields? Of knowledge that we had been completely blind to. The possibilities... Here we are, Kensington said as he rounded in the corner into a new room that looked like an antechamber of another room, with the windows looking inside. Before we get started, Crowley said, taking the lead, I'll need you to remove any metal items and change into this. She held up a thin garment that would barely call a gown. The electromagnets in this machine can rip them right out of your pockets, or anything sewn into your clothes. Ren nodded, reluctantly taking the garment. Not exactly something I wanted to go parading around in, but better careful than a cripple. Oh, and do you have any metal inside of you? Crowley asked, picking up a board with several papers held into it by a clip. Piercings, body modifications, debris and old wounds, anything. Ren shook his head. No, nothing like that. His ears dropped low as he realized that she was asking. I hope... I didn't see anything on that stood out in the x-ray, Kensington said. Just be sure to let us know if you feel any discomfort. He nodded as Crowley gave him an uncertain look, half holding out the clipboard. Normally we would have you fill out this screening form, but um, 
Can you read English? No, he said, frowning. The translation artifice only works for spoken language. He flicked his ear at Bradford. She can fill it out for me. Both women shrugged and Crowley handed the board to Bradford. She immediately wrote a few things down, then started going through the list of questions, some of which had obvious answers that she answered without asking him, though she dutifully read each line on the list. No, I'm definitely not pregnant. The form filled out. Bradford passed the board back to him along with one of the self-contained ink pens and tapped the block with the bottom where he needed to sign. He took a moment to inspect the pen. This one was clear, and he could see the tube of ink inside. The tip wasn't a point, but it was rounded. Fascinating, he said, before flicking the distraction away with his ears and carefully scrawling his name. He wasn't the greatest scribe in the world, but he was reasonably proud of his handwriting, and finished with a satisfying flourish before handing the board back and the pen back to Crowley. She then directed him to the changing room and began setting up the MRI machine. Several minutes later, Rin found himself lying on a table with an awkwardly thin gown sliding up into the tunnel of the MRI. The machine was loud. He wore a set of headphones to dampen the noise, and they helped, but they were not a perfect fit. All right, we're going to start with the baseline full body scan. Kensington's voice spoke to him through the headphones. This is going to take a while, and I'm going to need you to sit still through the whole process. After that, we'll do some brain scans while doing different activities, and we'll finish up with some magic, if that's a right. Red nodded and yipped an affirmative. The next few hours were a struggle of boredom, made increasingly unpleasant with his stomach began reminding him that he'd skipped lunch. He was directed to lie still for an hour, and it was all he could do to not fall asleep. And then he'd spend an hour wiggling his toes and hands and ears and tail, and he spent another hour being asked basic arithmetic. Time began to blur together, until Kensington said, All right, and now if you don't mind, try some magic. Finally, another hour to go, he sighed. Of course, he said. Is there anything in particular you want me to do? Well, let's leave lightning bolts off the table for today. Just something simple, preferably that you can maintain for a while. Right, Ren scratched his ear and thought for a moment before settling on a simple wisp-juggling illusion. He propped his hands over his chest and after a few moments' concentration, he had constructed the artifice. Ready when you are. Go ahead, Kensington said as the machine started again. Ren activated the artifice and a simple ball of light appeared and began to slowly bounce back and forth between his hands. As the minutes dragged on, he tweaked the art of wire, sending the light dancing and twirling between his hands and fingers. Eventually, the tweaking with the artifice and increased trickle of mana to add another wisp, and by the time he heard the machine powered down, he had eight wisps dancing and twirling around his hands. All done. You can come out and get changed now. Great, he said, dismissing the artifice and hopping off the table as soon as it had cleared the tunnel. I have to urinate. He heard Bradford's laughter in the background as Kensington's voice came over the headphones again. Second door past the changing room. The headphones were off and dropped on the table without a second thought as Rin splinted for the door. With the thought of imminent relief, his banner had slammed him with a renewed urgency. Skidding around the indicated door, he kicked it shut behind him and stared at the water bowl privy before him. It was similar enough to the portable outhouses the marines had set up all around their camps that he had no trouble figuring out how to do his business. But once he relieved himself, he realized he didn't know what to do from there. How do you replace the water in the bowl? Resecuring his gown, he stepped into the antechamber. So, uh, um, I don't know how to refresh the water. You mean flush the toilet? Bradford asked with a smile. Rin gave her an awkward shrug. There's a lever on it, you just push it down and it'll flush, she tilted her head. You've been holding that since we left the talk in this morning. No, oh, I used the shower, because it was all draining out anyway, and I didn't, uh... Wait, you urinated in my shower? Bradford stared at him with an expression that struck him as somewhere between horror and disgust. I put my hands in that shower. She stared down at them, fingers splayed. Ugh. It was right at the beginning, and I was careful to aim for the drain. I cleaned your fur out of the drain. <laughs> she pushed past him and rushed to go down the hall, stepping into another room just past the one he used. Go flush your goddamn toilet and wash your freaking hands. 
She shouted as she heard the sound of water on something pumping several times. Rin stared after her and then looked back at Kensington and Cowley, his ears low in distress. They both turned away, hands across their mouths, clearly trying not to laugh. Well, I'm glad someone's getting a laugh out of my experience, he thought, turning back to the toilet room with a snort. He found the lever in question and shoved it down and watched the yellowed water disappear with a loud whoosh, and the bowl was refilled. He stared at the toilet for a moment of frustration. It's not like I have any idea how any of this tosh works. He sighed, turning to the sink and found Kensington leaning against the door. Just between you and me, and don't ever tell my wife, but I piss in the shower too. Ren quirked and ear at him, and he winked and turned to go. Oh, and um, soaps in the dispenser on the wall, just pump it a couple times. He mimicked the action with his hands. Lather up real good and then rinse it all off. There will be a roll of paper towels in the box. He nodded. Just pull the lever a couple times and tear a sheet off. Rin nodded in thanks. Well, take a look at your scans after you get changed. Rin nodded again, turning on the water and pumping out a couple squirts of soap as Kensington left. Bradford was still washing her hands when he stepped into the changing room. When he stepped back out of the changing room, she had returned to the antechamber and cautiously joined them. Bradford, I'm sorry I... She stopped him by placing her hand on his shoulder. It's okay, you didn't know. It's something that never occurred to me that you wouldn't know, and it should have. She rolled her eyes. And, to be honest, I put my hands in far worse. It's fine. Her grip on his shoulder hardened, and she pulled him close, speaking low into his ear. But there will be payback. She patted his shoulder and gave him a cheerful smile. Let's take a look at your scans. He stared at her as he turned away. This woman is terrifying. Filing her comment away as something that he would definitely have to worry about later, he stepped over to the image boxes that Kensington and Crowley were operating. So here is what we got from the first set of images that establish your baseline. Crowley was operating the picture boxes, the computers. This time, while Kensington stood beside her, several images appeared alongside each other, like slices of a body. Bryn stepped over to the computers, leaning forward to examine them, and he recognized the shapes and position of a person's insides with ease. He had seen enough spilled out in battle. Like your skeleton, there are a few things that are easily identifiable. Heart, lungs, stomach, intestines. He pointed about the images, and their positions are similar to a human's, and some of these other organs though. He pointed at another shape. If I had to hazard one, I'd guess that that's your liver, but it looks like you have two of them. He cocked his ear at him. You only have one liver? Yes, but it can grow back if damaged. His ears spun and gave him full attention up to Kensington and an alarmed look. You can grow things back? Is that how they reattach limbs? Only some things, the doctor shrugged. Most of our liver, parts of our hearts and kidney, fingers and toes. He waggled his fingers at Rin. True regeneration is beyond us at the moment, but we have made great progress in the kinds of wounds that we can heal. And there is a promising research that could be some level of regeneration to medicine in the near future. He pulled out another of the roly chairs and sat down, flabbergasted. He was partly relieved that the humans didn't have some supernatural regeneration ability, and also amazed that they had thought themselves close to having a medicine that could give them the supernatural regeneration ability. He stared at the pictures of his guts, the lives that could be saved with that, by the five hells, the lives that could be saved by the medicine the humans have now, and I've barely seen what they have. Everything all right, Rin? Bradford asked, patting him on his shoulder. Yeah, he took a deep breath, regaining his composure. Yes, I'm just, um, he reached out to tug on a horn. All of this is starting to sink in. It's been a long week, hasn't it? She squeezed his shoulder. Yes, he said, staring past the desk. Yes, it has. She patted his shoulder and turned to Kensington. Doc, as fascinating as I am sure this biology lesson is, is there anything else you need from us? Just some paperwork, Commander Jenkins called over and explained what you needed. He nodded to Crowley. HM2 here will get you the paperwork. Bradford nodded, and then they followed Crowley into the hallway. Several minutes later, Rin was signing several consent forms. Bradford had summed them up with him giving permission to the U.S. government to study his medical data and use it for research purposes. He was more amazed that they had to ask permission than anything else. 
We'll have to put together a basic civics class for you on how our government works and why, Bradford said, and maybe some US history and Earth history. She frowned. I'm done trying to make it that list. It's too damn long already. Rin finished up scrolling his name on the last form and handed the clipboard back to Crowley. Is there anything else? No, that's it. We'll hang on to the medical records here, and we'll probably want to call you back for a few more exams that they aren't set up for in Tolkien, but nothing urgent. She held out a hand. It was a pleasure to meet you, Ayat. He reached out and clasped her forearm and Gandon way. And you, HM2. Sergeant, Crowley nodded at Bradford, who gave her the nod in return. All right, let's go find the others so that they can t- all take a turn at translating for you, Bradford said, turning to the elevators. Rin laughed, hurrying after her. What, you didn't like repeating everything I say? Well, maybe if you'd say something intelligent. She winked at him. He snorted, looking forward to the raising his chin. His ears swept back in a regal pose. You wouldn't understand it if I did. Ah, you get jokes, she grinned, slapping him on the shoulder. Do you hit everything? She pointed at herself. Marine. Yes. You're all crazy, he laughed as he stepped into the elevator. Hey, I'm one of the saner ones, she said, pulling a thin rectangle out of her pocket. And that's terrifying, he said, and then leaned over as the face lit up by the change as he swiped the thumb across it. What's that? It's my phone, she said, turning it to him to see. It's a mini computer I can carry in my pocket, and it lets me call and talk to other people like a radio, and I can also access the internet, which is a bunch of computers hooked together that people can use to communicate, share ideas, or access the most of human knowledge. You just, uh, keep that in your pocket. Dude, half the time I'm using this thing, I'm just looking at funny pictures of cats. She tapped her thumbs across the screen, and when she turned back to him, she scrolled through an image after image of small, furry creatures that somewhat resembled a Kishman. Aren't they adorable? Ren reached up and began tugging on his horn. Humans are crazy. Damn straight we are, she said as the door opened and she walked out, calling over her shoulder. And you haven't even seen the half of it yet. He groaned, scrubbing his face with his hands. What have I gotten myself into? He sighed. Better than being dead, I guess. The elevator chimed and the door started to close. He darted through and hurried after Bradford. By the time he caught up to her, she had her phone up to her ear. Yeah, we're on our way out right now. Awesome. Should I be worried? You know we have to be back in theater tonight, right? All right. Yeah, see you out front. She pulled the phone down from her ear and pressed something to black out the face of it and put it in her pocket. The rest of the squad is meeting us out front, and apparently they've already had plans for the rest of the day. Ren pointed an ear at her. Who made the plans? Kowalski. Both ears swung forward as he stared straight ahead, then swung back against his skull. We're going to get in trouble, aren't we? God, I hope not, she said as she walked through the doors. A conspicuous van pulled up in front of them. The side doors were flung open. Aye, there they are. About freaking time. Hey, get in the back. Make room for them, you fricks. Edison and Kimbo scrambled around and over the back of the front bench seat as Kowalski berated them. And Ren and Bradford climbed back onto the original seats. The rest of Marines had already changed out of the uniforms and were wearing a wide array of non-uniform clothing. Man, we were starting to worry that they abducted you with to Roswell to be dissected, Gomez said, twisting around in the shotgun seat. Nah, Jabs had never let that happen, Kowalski said as the door slammed and pulled away. So, where are we going? Bradford asked, ignoring what Rin assumed was a joke. Downtown for food, then a party on the beach, brah. Rin's stomach growled loudly at the thought of food. Oh good, I haven't eaten something since this morning. And you're not going to need to eat again until tomorrow morning, Samson said. Yeah, but first you two need to get changed into civvies, Kowalski said as he turned into the MCX parking lot, and we're going to have fun. Ten minutes later, Ren and Bradford were climbing back into the designated spots in the van. Bradford wore a blue jean, sneakers, and a faded shirt with an emblem of three triangles over an eagle on her chest, and a dark green jacket that she left open. She had pulled her hair out of a bun, and instead wore it like a tail coming out the back of her head. Ren was wearing blue jean, sneakers, and a dark red plaid shirt, 
He didn't pick out any of the clothes that he was wearing. All set? Kowalski asked. Nobody left behind. The door slammed. Nope, we're all aboard. Frigging A, he grinned. Goma, hit it. Aye, Gomez said, tapping on his phone and let been waiting his whole life for the moment. The speakers bled to life and they all pulled away from the MCX and headed out on their adventure. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.